You can still hear me okay, right? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, it's one o'clock now, so I think I'll get started. Does that sound that good? That's good, uh, everybody? Okay. Um, today, uh, we're gonna be talking about the human constitution, continuing, continuing with the journey of the soul and talk about the human constitution. And I was wondering if anybody has any questions from the previous times in the um, October or November talks. Not seeing any hands raised. All right. Okay. Um, in October, I discussed topics around the path of liberation and man's awakening to the spiritual path and its purpose. In November, I talked about the role of the observer in consciousness and the nature of the inner observation, about purification and the nature of crisis. And then I talked about meditation and its purpose and working as the observer in consciousness. Today, our theme, we're gonna be continuing with the theme of the soul evolving in consciousness. And today, we're gonna to be talking about the human constitution, its evolution and its various components. We will see that it is the conscious balanced integration of the forces of the threefold personality, which produces the lighted instrument capable of recording and reflecting the light of the soul. Gradually, the lights of the personality, the soul blend and the soul blend, and we as living souls become the lighted way. Evolution through the personality vehicles. 160 years ago, Darwin talked about the evolution of the human form. Our focus here is with the soul and the evolution of consciousness and the lower three vehicles, mental, emotional, physical. Discussion of the human constitution is about the evolution of consciousness through the personality taking place over multiple lifetimes. In theosophical and Eastern teachings, human evolution is understood as bringing the lower three bodies, mental, emotional, and physical, into an alignment and integration with the will of the soul. Through spiritual evolution, the monad or pure spirit causes consciousness to evolve through principles and the permanent atoms and the lower vehicles. These comprise the complete human being. The function of these principles, vehicles, and their inner relationship with each other will become evident to the spiritual seeker over time. A principle is that which is being developed on each of the seven planes and subplanes of the cosmic physical plane. Principle is the foundation upon which all things are built and the nature of all living forms. Examples of a principle would be the development of prana, manas, spiritual will, kama or desire, and buddhi. So that these various energies, these principles, they develop on those planes. Principle is a kernel of awareness holding the potentiality of full consciousness at some level of divine activity. So here we have the uh, human constitution chart. It's also known as the um, cosmic physical plane. It has the seven planes here from the logoic down to the etheric physical. And I don't know, can you, I don't know if people can see my cursor moving on the screen here, but if you look on uh, plane number three, the spiritual, You'll see at the top subplane there, that's the first subplane, uh, you will see the, um, that's, a, that's one of the permanent atoms there. 
and then you go down you go down to the next plane the one the intuition below that and you'll have the buddhic permanent uh, permanent atom i'll be talking about permanent atoms now so during the course of human evolution the monad appropriates five permanent atoms and the mental unit for purposes of manifestation on the lower planes just before any incarnation the permanent atoms are evoked from the causal body of the soul to give life to the etheric body and the new physical host each permanent atom and the mental unit are appropriated units or points of atomic matter and are connected to the sutratma or life thread each of the small each are small force centers. Each of these permanent atoms are small force centers around which various sheaths or bodies are built to function on each of the five planes of human existence. The purpose of the permanent atoms is to store and collect experiences of wisdom, both good and bad, during a given incarnation. It is only at death that the sutratma or the life thread is severed and the mental unit, the astral and the permanent atoms of the physical are withdrawn back to the causal body. So speaking of the complete human being, what makes us up and what is our purpose? It is the monad or pure spirit that wants full conscious awareness on all 49 planes and the subplanes of the cosmic physical. To create this awareness, the monad expresses through the spiritual triad known as the Atma, Buddhi, and the Manas. We'll get into the uh, spiritual triad shortly. And then to the soul and then down to the lower planes where dwells the threefold personality of the man in incarnation. As we evolve in consciousness, we eventually come to understand that our higher purpose as expressed through these vehicles is fulfilling the plan through service. Man's consciousness eventually awakens to the concept. His responsibility is service to the soul and eventually to the plan using his creativity with others in group work. Spiritual triad is often referred to as the higher mind in incarnation, just as the soul expresses through its lower triad, the mental, emotional and physical planes the monad expresses itself through the higher spiritual substance called the Atma Buddhi and the Manas. This is together the spiritual triad. It acts as a guidepost for the soul, the disciples and initiates for achieving the higher levels of consciousness. Each of these energies expressions correspond to the three aspects of the monad and are composed of the following substance. For Atma or spiritual will, it is the plane and the source of eternal ideas, divine archetypes and principles, and it represents the will aspect. For buddhi, that is spiritual love and wisdom and pure reason, buddhi is made up of intuition, pure reason, non-duality, and is the carrier of formless ideas. It represents the love aspect. And we have manas which is the higher mind or intelligence. Manas means mind and refers to the higher aspect of the mental plane where the soul dwells. Manas represents the intelligence aspect. The human being is essentially spirit or monad expressing through the spiritual triad. Since we are consciously disconnected with the spiritual triad, the soul's function is to act as a bridge between the higher triad with the lower personality vehicles. On the path of liberation, the soul guides the lower personality for integrating and replacing the lower expression of matter with the higher correspondence. Spiritual triad is like a magnet drawing the aspirant toward the spiritual triad, such as the booty is replacing the astral matter Eventually, the higher substance for these three aspects will replace the lower trinity or the mental, emotional, physical. Regular meditation will aid in this process. Late in the evolution of the soul, the personality, beginning on the path of probation and continuing with discipleship, will create a bridge or antakarana between the abstract mind and the higher manas. This will allow the intuition and pure reason to flow and bring the higher knowledge down to earth. 
threefold personality. Our mental, emotional, and physical etheric nature is called the threefold personality or the lower triad. The higher corresponding expression, the Atma Bodhi Manas, the spiritual triad, will eventually replace the matter of these lower vehicles. For the mental or mind aspect, also known as Manas, it represents how we think and how we process information and how we organize things. It's also called the finite or concrete mind. When speaking of the mental aspect, we understand the abstract mind and the causal body are part of the mental aspect. For the emotional astral, also known as Kama Manas, it is made up of desires, feelings, fears, happiness, hopes, sensitivities, and anxieties. The separated man or woman registers glamour, illusion, nature of desire. Emotions have an effect on the physical etheric form, as we know. For the physical etheric, it has a dense physical substance made up of energy, vitality, and has a nervous system and brain. Together, the mental body, the astral body, and the physical body, or vehicles or sheaths, make up each individual. As we will see from the conscious seeker on the path, they are the means for directly developing awareness of the soul for the aspirant to the disciple all the way up to the higher initiate, initiates. As much as we purify the mental, that is our thoughts, the, emo the emotional body, and we provide the soul with better vehicles for its light. I'll be discussing each of the lower three personality vehicles separately in its practical application and its purpose in the individual's life. So what is the purpose of the human mind in evolution? Human mind has intelligence and is the central faculty for cognition of man's life and his environment. It separates the human kingdom from the animal and it carries out the third aspect of divinity, active intelligence. Through the mind, man registers soul intent and this contributes to his mental understanding and leads toward progressive evolution and unfoldment of civilization. Human mind and consciousness have evolved through the intellect by the aspirant using discrimination and developing the abstract mind. This allows him to the ability for registering impressions for contacting the soul and the spiritual triad. On the spiritual path, as we expand our consciousness, we aspire to allow the higher manas of the soul to guide our mind thinking and thought construction. So talking about parts of the mind, uh, the mental plane consists of the concrete mind, the abstract mind, and the causal body or soul. That's the mental plane. It's also called the lower finite mind. Concrete mind is the reasoning, conceptual, logical, discriminating, separating things in consciousness principle. It is also the creator of new thoughts and ideas in the lower mind. This is seen by the scientist, the architect, the accountant, or anybody who analyzes data, comes to conclusions and distinguishes and discriminates between the real and the not real and sees the world through the five basic physical senses. When thought forms of the concrete mind become too focused, it blocks any ability for registering impressions and illumination from the soul. For this, it is recommended for the spiritual seeker to practice detachment and dispassion. This is most readily accomplished through meditation where you learn to identify with the soul's higher energies. The abstract mind is located on the higher mental plane and shares the same subplane space with the soul and causal body. It functions as a bridge between the concrete mind, physical plane, five senses, and the highest aspect of our mind, the soul. When alignment is achieved in meditation, the personality can receive impressions, ideas, intuition, and love from the soul via the abstract mind. Okay, I'll stop there for a moment and see if there's any questions.
people can raise their hands or they can write questions or comments in the chat box. Okay, I'll move on. The causal body or the soul. Causal body is the part of is the body of the soul. Um, its purpose is to facilitate the evolution of the personality of the aspirant to evolve into that greater self and awareness, the soul. It stores the highest wisdom and essence learned from both good and bad experiences via the permanent atoms that a personality accumulates over a given lifetime. The essence of what was learned as a kind of is a kind of wisdom stored in the permanent atoms. From an esoteric viewpoint, bad actions or karma are unwise use of energy and force, often through selfish motive of the personality. When we speak of karma in this way, we are usually referring to events and situations in a particular lifetime where the personality was focused on expressing motives which may be selfish and that the soul was not a guiding factor. In cases like this, there is stored negative energy in the causal body and that must be transformed and purified. Good energy is referring to the higher expression of consciousness within the personality produced by performing non-selfish deeds such as altruism and service to others. From actions and experience, wisdom is gained. Though the wise use of energy and force, the personality together with the soul learned to use this knowledge to facilitate its growth. The causal body lasts throughout countless incarnations and is only destroyed at the fourth initiation when all karmic experiences are purified and the need for the human to incarnate and continue the cycle of rebirth is no longer necessary. <clears throat> so connecting with the spiritual triad from this image here you can see that uh, this is the this is the entire mental plane right here the upper part of the mental plane is the causal body of the soul and between that is uh, the abstract mind uh, where you have the mental unit there, it's actually on the second subplane. The first subplane is where it says mental here, and the second subplane is monastic plane. That's the second, that's where the abstract mind is. And the third one is where most people are registered or located. That's in their uh, mental unit or their concrete mind. So within the uh, this lower mental plane, there is a, or within the lower mental plane period, uh, there is a gap in consciousness. Um, and this exists between the, uh, the mental plane of where the soul dwells and the spiritual triad. This gap is in essence a block, to, a block of communication from the spiritual triad and thus blocks the process of at one moment or creating unity consciousness to take place. The gap can be bridged by the creation of what's called the Antakarana via a visualization or thought form created by the aspirant. Note, note that visualization is an act of will. The aspirant and later disciple bridges the gap in meditation by visualizing a line of energy across the abstract mind. The connection begins on the path of probation and continues on the paths of discipleship and initiation. The real work of bridging involves the disciple using his will to create the lower aspects, that is the threefold personality and combined with the three divine aspects of the spiritual triad. He will do this with thought energy, uh, that is visualization. The correspondence is as follows. The lower concrete mind relates to the manas, the astral emotional relates to the buddhi, and the physical relates to the atma or spiritual will. So by creating this antakarana, if you see this here in the diagram, the, the aspirant who is in meditation, he visualizes a line to connect with the higher mind or the soul, and the soul is automatically in connection with the, uh, with the spiritual triad already. 
the soul is the lowest point of the spiritual triad. Separation and cleavage, cleavages in the mind. The concept of cleavage is understanding that certain divisions and separations exist between a particular vehicle of the personality and with the soul. A separation inhibits or blocks fusion and integration, such as between the emotional and mental bodies and the personality and the soul. In essence, cleavage is identifying any separations that exist in consciousness that prevent or inhibit the flow of the intuition, impressions, and illumination coming from the soul or spiritual triad. This is especially important to know during the integration process on the path of discipleship, where you become a conscious observer of energies and processes happening in your consciousness. And cleavage is also overcome through meditation by allowing the forces and energies of the soul to flow uninhibited throughout the consciousness and the etheric body. Meditation and using the abstract mind facilitates reorientation of the personality so it can connect with the soul and the spiritual triad. This is most, this is most readily accomplished by bridging the gap between the lower mind and the higher mind. <clears throat> the astral plane is the plane of emotions. It is a conglomeration of interacting forces, energies, such as emotions and feelings that create illusion, glamor, and distorted depiction of reality. The major purpose of the path of liberation is to completely purge all distorted views of reality for enabling clear seeing on all planes. This is achieved through alignment and integration with the soul. So we understand that emotion is a reaction to someone or something and stimulates the feeling nature in the astral body. This results, the results are often the emotions of fear, love, jealousy, hate, anger, greed, joy, elation, and desire. The conscious seeker is keenly aware of the dualities felt in his, his astral body, such as feeling pleasure, but he's also keenly aware of the opposite being pain. At some point on the path, he will understand that becoming unattached through dispassion and bringing balance and alignment to his nature will result in eventual integration and liberation. In the advanced stages of spiritual development during the second initiation, for example, he will willfully suppress those feelings that are destructive to the soul's nature. We know that negative emotions can be transformed through a mental understanding and applied techniques. Thus, in meditation, you will observe the negative emotion, such as anger, and how it, re and how it creates a separation in consciousness from others and blocks any higher inspiration from the soul. When you are confronted with a glamour or illusion in your astral body, it is best dealt with on the mental plane, that is, the next plane above the astral, with help from the soul, and using the mental techniques, such as what I handed out before, the, um, the techniques that for working in consciousness. Um, Referring specifically to one of the techniques, the technique of light, you can bring awareness of what you are emotionally dealing with and merge with the soul to bring forth the higher aspect to overcome it. For example, the energies of hatred and tolerance and separatism are balanced with cooperation and goodwill. Remember how this technique works. The glamour or the hindrance or the obstacle in the astral in the astral body is identified and the personality and the soul work in cooperation to shed the soul's light on it to transform it. Using this technique, you are achieving alignment and integration with the soul by allowing the higher booty to replace the lower reactive astral nature. Booty from the plane of the intuition represents a higher expression of love, sensitivity, compassion, pure reason, and intuition, and causes refinement and redemption of the lower astral matter. 
are there any uh, questions so far? Questions or comments? There's a hand raised. Okay. Nasa, please go uh, ahead. Um, years ago, there was a book uh, running around like in the 70s. Uh, and it was based, the primary, the foundation of it was uh, consciously um, linking, clearing, I would just say clearing the Antikarana. It was by two disciples. And I was wondering if you were familiar with that work and what you thought of it. There was more to it than that, you know, but, but that was. Well, I'm, I'm not familiar exactly with that particular work you're referring to, but uh, in this teaching and philosophy, uh, which can be theosophy, from Blavatsky, and we can also talk about Alice Bailey too, and teachings of the Tibetan. We're basically talking about creating an Antikarana because the gap between the um, the mind, the usual mind that we have, the discriminatory mind that we have all the time, which is analyzing and thinking about things, that's on the that's what we call the concrete mind. It's when we start um, connecting with the soul. And then we wanted to connect even higher than that. We want to connect with the spiritual triad and bring bring forth intuition and impressions. Um, that's when we need to have that gap or that ident we've identified the gap. It's it's missing there between because we're not easily able to connect with the spiritual triad. So that's why we need the visualization with the uh, to create the antakarana. So it, it does have a major function there, and uh, it's probably. I mean, you can you start creating it when you're in the uh, plane of um, uh, the um, the probationary path, and then continuing on with the discipleship and forward. Uh, so you're you're actually consciously created in meditation, uh, at least with this teaching you are. With uh, the Moria Federation does that, the Arcane School does that with their teachings. So it's uh, it's something to be aware of. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Excellent. Any other questions, Michael? Just a minute. Gang, did you have a question or comment? You're unmuted. If no, uh, Anne asks to please explain a bit more about the negative energy in the soul. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to a previous slide. So hold on here. Uh, let's go to the permanent atoms here. Okay, um, this this slide right here, back in the permanent atoms. Okay, so when when the soul incarnates, you know it's been going on for thousands of years, whatever. It's been uh, incarnating, and it creates a a soul and a personality, and it creates its own host, or it cre it finds its own host based on karmic needs and everything. Well, every time the personality is created and a new uh, a new body, it uses permanent atoms, and in these permanent atoms, you have here you have the atomic permanent atom, the buddhi, the uh, monastic uh, permanent atom. You have the mental unit, you have the astral, and you have the physical permanent atoms. So you have those permanent atoms, and they store information about who you have been previously in previous incarnations. It stores the uh, the wise use of energy, and it stores the bad use of energy, or the uh, I should say inefficient or non. Uh, it doesn't. It's the unhelpful energy. Let's put it that way. Anything that creates karma is stored in these permanent atoms. And when the person dies, the satratma or the life thread is cut, and then you die. And all those permanent atoms are withdrawn back to the soul or the causal body. And so to use again during the next incarnation. So until the soul completely reaches liberation at the fourth initiation, and then all the permanent atoms are then withdrawn to the monad, way up here on the, uh, the, the second plane, the monadic plane. So the permanent atoms basically have a function of just storing information. And what the 
what the monad does with them after we have complete liberation from the physical plane, that information is not well known, or I should say it's not, it's not well articulated in the uh, teachings. But for the time being, for all intents and purposes, through all the initiations, we basically have to basically redeem our lower vehicles. We have to redeem the emotions. We have to, with, with booty and with pure reason and, um, and the mental, the mental plane has to be purified too. So we get to a point where we're, we're, we're completely, from the soul's point of view, we are pure in consciousness. So that information stores in the permanent atoms. Did that answer your question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I can barely yes. hear you. Uh, can you hear me now a bit better? Yeah, yeah speak up a little bit, please. Uh, one moment, please. Is this a bit better? Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you, but I can't hear you very well. The volume is not very high. Okay, I'll try to do my best. Uh, oh, that's better now. It's better. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, when you answered me, uh, a, a, a question popped in my mind. I know that the uh, permanent atoms uh, store, uh, store energy. Are they part of the soul? Are they in the soul? Uh, yes, they are. Yeah, the source, the soul stores the permanent atoms throughout our incarnation, and um, and, and they are, they are, um, they're, they're on a, they're etheric energy. They're on the well, they're made of a. According to the teachings, they're made of atomic matter. I don't know what that exactly means. That's what Dual Cole and that's what Alice Bailey call it. They call it atomic matter. So if we want to say that the entire cosmic physical plane is made up of uh, various levels of atomic matter, we can say that it's obviously from the highest point, the you know, with a pure spirit and the monad is a very fine state of matter. And then we go down to the dense physical plane where we exist. And those are more, uh, it's obviously more dense and more coarse. And the physical, the, uh, phys the, the permanent atoms are all stored there. And they exist basically in our etheric bodies during our incarnation. And, and we are interconnected also with the soul. So it, it, we have this symbiotic relationship with the soul at all times. Okay, I uh, understand that. But when we die, you said that the soul uh, takes the permanent atoms in. It's like uh, there is a, mo a, a movement because yeah, they're I withdrawn. Know they're, they're withdrawn withdraw on the Satratma. Yeah. Uh, they go from the because each of them are on the first uh, on the first plane a subplane of each plane except of the the, the permanent monastic atom. That's they right. Are, that's where they are drawn. But when we die, uh, the soul takes them in. That's right. That's right. So there's a movement of these permanent atoms. Uh, well, they're they're fixed as long as we're alive. As long as you're alive, you have the permanent atoms, which are which is your, uh, your mental, emotional, and physical. And then those are withdrawn when you die, when anybody dies, they, those atoms are withdrawn back to the soul. The soul and the causal body are one and the same, and they're stored in the causal body of the soul when, after we die. Okay, thank you. No problem. Anybody else? That's all I'm seeing at the moment. Okay, so let's now talk about emotions and how they affect the body in different ways. <clears throat> and this will lead us into a discussion about the physical etheric vehicle. <clears throat> so what happens when desire is so strong that you don't get your way or you can't have the object of your desire? The result, the lower mental body and the vital body are impacted and stressed. The medical profession and the mainstream media have long time recognized a direct correlation between the mental attitudes, emotions, and the body, the mind-body connection. For example, we know that anger centers around the agitated solar plexus, or the third chakra, we'll get into the chakra shortly, located around the stomach level. This results in experiencing problems around digestion, pain in the abdomen, anxiety, fear, worry, and headaches. We know that the nervous and endocrine systems work with the glands. 
The glands, when stressed, will secrete hormones, such as adrenaline, into the bloodstream, causing a general unsettled feeling, possibly fear, anxiety, hatred, separativeness, and selfishness. With an increased amount of adrenaline in the system, the person may become more aggressive and unstable. And needless to say, these all block soul energies. With feelings of love and goodwill and cooperation and warmth about life, your work, and towards other people you are with, then the body will not be stressed and works in natural harmony and can be a tool for service. Of course, this is the spiritual goal we are all striving for. Without emotional stress or me lower mental anxiety, the higher mind is engaged. This allows for impressions, higher ideas, ideals, intuition, and the flow of the soul's consciousness. For dealing with any of these anxieties, the technique of light is an excellent tool for overcoming astral limitations. The physical etheric body. The dense physical form is made up of the physical body, its organs, and the five senses. The etheric vital body is made up of the chakras and what they call nadis. Both are animated by the soul via the satratma and functions on the physical plane through the personality. On the subtle level, the etheric or vital body is, is the lowest form of response apparatus and represents the focus of pure spirit via the soul in the dense material world. The etheric body is directly related to physical health and is seen as the vitalizing energy for the individual while in physical incarnation. It's made up of more subtle matter than the dense physical form. Its primary function is to receive and transmit force or forces such as prana and stimulation from the soul to the organs, the endocrine and the endocrine system and the nervous system and the bloodstream. The splenic center, which is considered to be a relatively minor chakra, uh, of the etheric body is a transmitter of vital energies that reach the physical form from the sun, from prana, and from other vital sources in the environment. For other sources of vitality, the soul animates the vital body through the life thread or satratma, which conveys the life principle in the heart and throughout the body via the bloodstream. It is only at death that the satratma or life thread is severed and the mental, astral, physical permanent atoms are withdrawn back to the causal body. So here we are with the chakra system now, the centers of energy. On the etheric and dense physical level, there are seven major energy centers or chakras or nadis and nadis, which affect the human physiology each has a corresponding effect on glands of the endocrine system and the physical organs. They are at the crown center at the top, it regulates the pituitary body and the brain. The Ajna center or third eye re uh, regulates the pineal gland, the ears, the nose, and the eyes. The throat, the throat center regulates the thyroid gland, bronchial tubes, the lungs, and the vocal cords. The heart center regulates the thymus gland for helping with the immune system or immune response we have in our body. The solar plexus regulates the pancreas, the liver, and the stomach. At the sacral, the sacral chakra regulates the gonads and the reproductive system. And at the base, it regulates the adrenal glands. These energy centers, these energy centers are overlaid and connected to the physical human body through the satratma or the life thread. They are all stimulated by the soul at the periodic intervals in the aspirant's life to facilitate an alignment in lower mental, emotional, and physical nature and bring the personality into a coherent and functioning unit.
Now here we have a diagram that shows the nadis or the carrier of life, the carriers of life energy. The etheric body is made up of an extensive network of tiny lines of force called nadis. That's a Sanskrit term incidentally. Um, these are finer and subtler matter from the physical and they correspond to the human nervous system. Through these lines of force, the system is nourished and conditioned. They're also important for the function of consciousness and sensation of the human aura. The nadis also interconnect with the seven major chakras and flow from the base spinal column to the head, as you can see in the diagram here. During expansions of consciousness, the three main channels in the etheric body come into play, known as the Ida, the Pingala, and the Shashumna. The Shashumna is the line that is in the middle there, and the Ida and the Pingala are on either side there, interacting, or I should say inner, inner connecting with the Shashumna. The three channels under the direction of the soul and consciously aware disciple willfully move energies up and down the channels to hasten the burning away of any remaining etheric webs and blockages surrounding any center. Now it's most likely that um, if somebody is going to be a, the consciously aware disciple as I so call it, this is most likely during the second initiation. Uh, it's more of an advanced concept of where you're willfully working with these energies. And you could be using uh, breathing techniques. Um, you could be working with a teacher, a physical teacher, or you could be working with a teacher on the inner planes also to help you uh, move these energies. Okay, dynamic chakra connections. Oh, first of all, is there any questions on uh, the chakra, uh, the chakras? questions on that yes there are oh okay go for it yes um, Vivian had a question earlier but indicated that uh, you were answering her question Good. and it's about a process that happens naturally um, uh, if we tend to try too hard to reach a spiritual state and then Karsten asks what about the chakra in the head and the oil produced streaming down the shishumna? Well, that's that's uh, that that all interconnects with the concept of cleavage, that the disciple, an aspirant disciple, is identified a problem in consciousness. I have this block, and trying to connect with the higher planes, for example, the buddhic plane or something, and so I need to work with that with my soul or learn new techniques to uh, bridge that gap. And as a result, um, that will that will break up the uh, the anything that's blocking your uh, connection. So, um, what was the other part of that question again? The oil produced streaming down the shushumna. Um, well, like like I say, when you're getting into the inter inter intermediate and advanced stages of working in consciousness willfully moving energies around then you're automatically working with the crown center you're quite possibly working with the third eye also which i'll talk about in a few minutes here um where you're where you're consciously directing energies and you're uh, there's the old axiom that energy follows thought so you learn to mentally focus your thoughts and dynamically connect with what's going on in your consciousness i've got this blockage so i use this technique to neutralize it or transform it so it's basically and the crown center is activated really it's more of an advanced stage that's really activated and you become consciously active of it. But it, a, a portion of the crown center is active during discipleship, but it's just that you become more aware of it later on in more advanced stages. Did that answer the question? I'm not sure, but Karsten added Christ. Um, well, I'll be talking about this more when we get into the uh, the uh, uh, the higher initiations or all the initiations and in, uh, I think that's in um, when is that one going to be well it's going to be in February 
Um, but basically there is a, there's a point in the uh, disciples evolution, particularly at the second initiation where he or she will be confronted with taking the path of going toward the divine or staying the path of going toward involution or the selfish path, using the selfish will to create what you want in your life. And so that is, that is a point of where uh, you uh, make a decision to uh, go on a higher path or stay on the lower path. And so your initiations are, uh, you're limited in that way if you go on the lower path, of course. And we all look forward to that. <laughs> yes, you. getting past that, yes. <laughs> That's okay. it for now. That's it for now. Great. Okay. Um, dynamic chakra connections. This is a subject seldom discussed in esoteric literature, but it is important for becoming aware of the energy dynamics happening in your consciousness. For the everyday person, the three centers below the heart, namely the uh, base, the sacral, and the solar plexus centers are most active. Through meditation, and after a measure of spiritual unfoldment, the heart and the throat centers also just slowly began to slowly awaken. Keep in mind that during the probationary and discipleship phases of spiritual development, the aspirant is being overseen by the soul. But whereas the soul may be present 24 seven for a connection, it is incumbent on the aspirant to reach out and consciously align with it. This is akin to the personality cooperating with the soul. And of course, this can also be cooperating with the soul can also be using the technique of light too, by saying you have this obstacle, I've identified this obstacle or hindrance in my consciousness. And so I want to merge the soul light with that of my personality and shed light on that glamour or that illusion or that obstacle. Um, the soul is not inactive during the development phase, that is the probationary and discipleship phases. It too wants the aspirant to succeed in its spiritual development. The soul stimulates the aspirant through impression and through stimulation of the chakras. <clears throat> so what happens when the soul stimulates the chakra or the center into activity? During spiritual development in the aspirant's life, the lower chakras have a corresponding interaction with the higher. Let's look at some chakra combinations. You could have a two five chakra combination where the uh, sacral center, that is the sexual energies, the vital and the creative work, work in combination with the throat center. This energy combination produces the public speaker, a person of creativity, etc. So that's the sacral center and the throat together. You can have a three, four combination. And this is a person working with the solar plexus, but balances it with love and awareness of working with the group in the fourth center. Cooperation and goodwill will facilitate this connection. This is the solar plexus and the heart working together. If you have a two, four combination, sacral center and the heart. It is a combination of the physical expression of warmth and love, or could be lovemaking. And again, that's the sacral center and the heart. You can have a three, five combination uh, where the person says what he feels, basically. He's basically, I feel this emotion or I feel this anxiety or whatever, I'm, and I'm verbalizing it so it comes out through the throat. So that's the solar plexus in the throat. You could have a two six combination, which is a sacral center in the third eye combination. This person has an inspired idea or vision in the sixth center that is vitalized from the sacral center. With an awakened third eye, he can learn to willfully carry out his work. This would be most likely be a person who wants to create a clear thought form for manifestation, such as like starting a project, for example, or a major project or a major new path, for example, like new starting a new job, for example, is that's a major, that's a major activity in one's life. A natural unfoldment of the centers and their activity is recommended through meditation, spiritual study and general purification of the thought life, such as practicing goodwill and harmlessness. 
if the aspirant's efforts are directed towards selfless service to humanity, this mindset will balance the energies of the etheric body and they will develop to uh, they will develop and unfold in a natural and soul oriented way. Finally, the esotericist knows that the knows that the uh, centers from the heart to the crown will remain dormant unless there is a stimulation by the soul in accordance with spiritual unfoldment. The aspirant knows never to directly influence the centers as directly interacting with any one center can cause physical, emotional, or mental consequences, such as emotional or mental instability. So when we're talking about directly interacting, that means you go into meditation and say, let me, let me stimulate my third, my third chakra, my third center, and you can then you can uh, open up that energy much more and cause all sorts of problems and unintended consequences. Uh, training the bodies and the vehicles for service. When I speak of training here, I'm referring to preparing the matter of the physical and etheric bodies for a connection with the soul and performing service. A body composed of spiritual, spiritually unprepared lower and dense matter will prevent the aspirant from making contact with the higher vibration of the soul. Keep in mind that the higher vibration of the soul would have virtually no impact or on a non-evolved physical brain or etheric body. <clears throat> to prepare and maintain the physical and etheric body to be an agile and useful tool for, for the soul in service, it is recommended at a minimum that the aspirant has the following daily regimen in place. Uh, pure and vital food. Individual must decide whether to eat pure food, such as organic or a vegetarian diet, as feels appropriate. Cleanliness. Practice good hygiene. Keep the body clean from disease, certainly applicable during the days of COVID. Uh, plenty of sunshine. Take, in, take it in where and when it's healthy to do so, as it helps with the vitalization of the body. The splenic chakra also helps with absorbing the uh, prana. Plenty of sleep. The aspirant must have enough sleep to enable him to carry out his spiritual work with the greatest facility. If the physical body is tired or lacking in energy due to poor nutrition or not enough rest, then the body controls the situation and keeps the aspirant from making soul contact and performing meaningful service. And of course, physical exercise. Daily exercise or engaging in physical activity is important for maintaining a healthy body. Exercise will benefit to help overcome health conditions and diseases and help change one's mood. Diet and exercise helps in soul development and unfoldment. Besides diet and exercise helping in your overall well-being, it also helps to maintain a sound mental, emotional, and physical vehicles for service. This overall mindset provides you of an awareness that you are fully unified being expressing the soul's intent moving through you. Finally, I also recommend that you have a regular spiritual practice in place. And I'll be discussing that in detail in February's talk. Any questions at this point? Okay, Karsten has put in a link uh, regarding a meditation, I think, done in Portuguese to, uh, to release the Christ within. And then Roz has written, is it possible to awaken a chakra by accident? For example, doing physical exercise. Uh, that I don't know. I, um, I suppose if you hit your head, <laughs> if you have an accident or something and you hit your head, you could possibly cause something to take place. But I would obviously not recommend to do that, of course. But physical exercise, I would say generally, no, that doesn't really happen. But, but what you're doing, the more you exercise and the more you're causing your body to be vitalized, you're, you are stimulating your vital energies and they are moving. And so you could, you could on subtle levels and 
possibly stimulate uh, things going on. But I would generally say no, that exercise by itself will not necessarily affect the chakras. It's, it's more the, 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 it's more the mental exercise that you do that really uh, causes the stimulation to take place. And again, I recommend very strongly, of course, that you do meditation and allow the soul to come through you, move through you, uninhibited, unencumbered, and uh, that will help with the uh, natural unfoldment of um, all the vital energies of your body and the free flowing, rele releasing of uh, obstacles and hindrances, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's my recommendation. That, I mean, certainly there are, there are groups that, uh, that recommend playing with the Kundalini and, uh, and breathing exercises to cause uh, the, the energies to move up and down the Sushumna, you know, life thread and to stimulate the chakras. I, you know, unless you're working with a real teacher that you can trust, I wouldn't recommend doing this stuff at all because you will stimulate something inside of you, possibly several centers at once or vital areas of the body and they will cause all sorts of mental and emotional instability in your consciousness. And that is definitely something you don't want to play with. So I, that's my recommendation. Any other questions? No more at this moment. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, let's go on to our final piece today, and that's about the uh, function and purpose of the third eye. Third eye exists in etheric matter, that's the sixth chakra, and it is the center of force situated just in front of the forehead between the two physical eyes. It is the etheric correspondence of the pineal gland. In esoteric literature, it is known as the all-seeing eye, the eye of the magician, the eye of vision, the director of energy, and the eye of the soul. On the path of discipleship, both the crown and ajna centers become active. There, the disciple who is, in, who is soul integrated and directed learns to use the third eye as a primary instrument with the soul. Together, they create a magnetic field. In Alice Bailey's book, in Alice Bailey's book, uh, Esoteric Psychology, Volume Two, the Tibetan Dual Kul says these two centers, the um, the uh, crown and the uh, third eye, uh, ex are externalized by the two glands, the pineal and the pituitary body. They become vibrant and alive and intensely active through service and meditation and right aspiration line of contact between them is eventually set up and established with increasing potency. There is also another line of outgoing fiery power toward the top of the spinal column. As the life of the soul gets stronger, the radiance of the center increase, centers increases and the periphery of their sphere of influence is set up creating a dual magnetic field. Another point uh, here, um, is the idea that later on in discipleship, the, the, the stages of discipleship, when your mind becomes much more, you, you've cleared away a lot of uh, anxieties and hindrances and blockages in your consciousness. You've already started the process of replacing the astral with the booty matter. So you're able to start thinking more clearly. And as a result, as you start thinking more clearly, your mind becomes more powerful you become more radiant and your your mental capacity is also more powerful too it's just it's just something that takes place because we are we are inhibited when our emotions get in our way that's just another way of putting it too so it's just something to keep track of so from this we understand that the third eye has multiple functions it provides the disciple with inner vision in the subjective realms to direct energy in all mental creative work and his path for service. It manifests as a result of the vibratory interaction between the forces of the soul working through the pineal gland and the forces of the personality working through the pituitary body. When these two forces interact, the light in the head is produced. The disciple uses the third eye as an organ through which he is the director of energy for all creative work. 
being aware and setting up this dynamic between your lower mind and the soul will facilitate your creative service and group work. The third eye is the organ of illumination from the soul. The disciple can create thoughts to control and direct energy of matter in the threefold personality through visualization techniques, as I've already discussed. This allows him to be in touch with causes more than effects. This is the uh, this is the phrase I used before, energy follows thought. So as much as you think on something, then you start affecting it. When thought forms, ideas, and abstractions are visualized and are potent enough, this will produce the light in the head and thought forms and ideas are brought into etheric being. Third eye is developed through the practice of lower of the power of visualization. With this, illumination enters the mind and irradiates the lower threefold personality. The third eye can also function as a destructive faculty. This is in reference to eliminating anything in consciousness, such as thought forms that inhibits the soul's life and the developing higher will energy of the monad to take place. Think of it when using the technique of light as it destroys and transform a troublesome thought form. In essence, the third eye opens and functions as a result of conscious development through right alignment integration with the soul right life, with the soul life. Okay. That is, that is all I have for today. I'd like to go into a meditation uh, after any questions or comments that you have. And Kim asks, can you speak more about forces of soul work through the pineal, forces of personality work through the pituitary? And she's not sure if she got that the right way around. Um, well, the, the third eye, it, the third eye really becomes much more effective and much more um, active during the path of discipleship. And uh, as I, I'll talk about in January, I think it's January. Uh, yeah, I talk about the stages of discipleship in more detail. And I'll also be talking about uh, a couple other things I'll get to in a moment. But, but during this, but during the uh, path of discipleship, you're, you're becoming much more conscious of working with the soul consciously. You're much more aware of it. You're much more aware of its presence and its influence. And so as a result, the soul, the soul is um, stimulating, stimulating the different chakras, the different centers in your, in your etheric body and causing you to go through changes personally. Uh, it de definitely causing you to go through changes to enable you to do greater service, to open your mind up for different expansions, uh, for different uh, possibilities and different directions to go. <clears throat> so this is this is a major thing that's going on in the background with the, the soul was really the directing energy. And um, as far as um, using the third eye as a, a directing point or is a, um, it's a director of energy uh, for all creative work. So if you, if you have an idea in your head and you want to you want to start this project or maybe you're an artist and you want to get into a certain particular project uh, maybe you're you work uh, you work in some type of industry where you have to put together a project and assemble a team of people and you have a whole thought form of the idea about what needs to be accomplished uh etc cetera, etc cetera. this can be vitalizing that thought form and uh, it, it's that there is a there is a spiritual context and there's a physical plane outer manifestation as a form of service that can take place also. So this is it's all it's all intertwined together. And uh, most people, I should say, most people that are very successful in the world, at least on a material way, um, could be in a spiritual way too, but. Uh, most people are they have they have a somewhat of an activity going on with their third eye already and they don't even know it they're not even conscious of it and of course most people in the world have all sorts of 
connections with their soul happening on the background, the interact on the inner planes, and most people are not aware that's happening at all. Most people aren't even aware they have a soul. But that we're, we're here because we're consciously aware of that and we want to work with this energy and invite it in and allow it to drive our energy, so to speak, towards service and uh, hopefully making the plan much more accessible to the world. I could go on and elaborate with that, but you understand what the point. So did I answer the question? She writes, the question is more in relation to pineal and pituitary and the distinction between the soul or personality using one or the other. Well, I don't, I don't know. See, I, I, I'm going to guess that the soul is the one that decides which gland to stimulate and at what time. I mean, I as the personality, I as the uh, disciple, aspirant, I don't work directly with my pituitary body or I don't work directly with my pineal and to make changes happening unless I'm a high level initiate, which I am not, or master or whatever. So I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't directly work with those uh, particular glands in the endocrine system directly. Um, I mean, I don't, I personally don't have the knowledge to do that and uh, the, and, and what the, con the potential consequences that could be for uh, stimulating something ahead of its time, so to speak, or when it's not ready, or stimulating something in order to have a particular reaction or result, and you may not know the full ramifications of what that could cause in consciousness. So again, this is another concept of um, if you're working with a physical plane teacher uh, that you trust, that's one thing. Certainly working with the soul in meditation to stimulate and guide any direction of this uh, of the um, of the unfoldment of the centers is a, a wise wise thing to do. Any other questions or comments? I am not seeing any hands raised or other uh, questions comments <clears throat> in the chat box. Okay. Um, Okay, before I before we go into meditation, I'll just say that uh, for my next talk in January, I'll be talking about service and spiritual study, study, and that are vital that are two vital parts of a spiritual practice, and I'll also be discussing the importance of discipleship in its various stages. So um, that's for the January January 9th, I think it is. Yes, it'll be a month from today, or a month from now, four weeks from now. Yes. So uh, if there's any other questions or comments, it'd be a great time for doing it now before we go into meditation, in alignment meditation. <clears throat> okay. So for an alignment meditation, connecting with the soul, Let's take two or three deep breaths and relax and become physically comfortable. Raise your consciousness upward through the emotional astral body and the mind towards the soul. Your, feeling, your feelings will become calm and serene. With this process, your mind becomes mentally poised and alert. You become the observer in your mind and remain in a listening or noticing mode.
as the observer, become aware of any impressions that may have come to you in an attitude, in an attitude of blessing. Realize as you hold this inner focus, your mental, emotional, and astral, and physical etheric bodies, that is your threefold personality, are functioning as one. <clears throat> The soul's light infuses the personality with love, the light of wisdom, health, and vitality, and dissipates all that hinders your well-being. You're at one with the soul and the higher will.
sound the ohm to harmonize the threefold personality in relation with the soul. Let us return to the physical present moment. Are there any um, final questions or comments anybody has? I am looking for hands raised and there are none. Uh, Michael, the other Michael has put in um, some information for everyone regarding um, recordings and information and, and the links to those. All right. And uh, some thank yous going into the chat box now. Wonderful. So as I said, uh, next time in January, we'll be talking about um, the other two uh, pillars, as we call them, of a spiritual practice, which is uh, service and spiritual study. And uh, we'll also be talking about the stages of the discipleship and getting um, getting much stronger sense of what the entire path of the soul is or the journey of the soul is. Um, these uh, this talk will be um, will be posted to um, Makara, and notice on the Makara website where they're posted, there's also uh, other handouts and powerpoints of my previous uh, two talks, so those can be also useful to you also. And Michael. Uh, has put the link to the Makara web page into the chat box again. Great. Um, very clear articulation of concepts. Um, very interesting. So much good information to rewatch and digest. Yeah, you can go over the, you can, you can go onto Makara and then go onto the uh, PowerPoint after it's there and just listen to it over again if you want to, of course absorb all you want. And we want to thank Anne for doing the interpretation into Vietnamese as well. Okay, great. I think that wraps it up. I think so. So thank you everybody for coming and your interest and um, Keep connecting on the inner planes with your higher self, the soul. I'll see you all next time in January, January 9, at the same time. Take care, everybody. Oh, yeah, Happy New Year. And uh, depending upon your cultural orientation, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Christmas, as some people say, and uh, Happy Hanukkah for some. So we'll see everybody in the new year. Be safe. Take care all. 
Uh, Michael Crow, I'd like to talk to you. Are you still there? 